while you're I don't even know what to call it. Sorry. Like, while you're having sex, yeah. are you like, were you enjoying it? Like genuinely? So I think it's like, it's going to sound crazy. It's like any other job. Right. So some days you go in and you're like, I fucking love what I do. This is amazing. I was meant for it. And other days you're like, when do I get paid? And when do I get to leave? Like, I just do not want to be on the set anymore. Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode of Vulnerable. I am your host, Chelsea Vaughn. And today we have a very special episode with a guest. Her name is Candace Horvath, and she's most commonly known as Eva Lovia. And she's a former adult entertainer in the porn industry. Um, this is not an episode I ever planned on doing or thought I was doing, but Candace reached out to me and I thought it was so interesting. And she's kind of just redefining the way that people look at entertainers in the porn industry and she's really fantastic and smart and I asked her everything that you would want to know possibly about like the industry and how porn affects her relationship and just being in relationships and dating someone in general um so I feel like I was very much the listener for this because she had so much to say was really amazing because she was willing to go there with any topic I asked her. Nothing was off limits. And it was great. Um, so I feel like it was perfect that I was in this role because I have never, I guess I've never been curious and done a deep dive into the industry. And I learned so much that I had no idea I was even going to learn. So I think you guys, as long as you keep an open mind, it's nothing crazy. Um, but you guys know I am very real on this podcast and we talk about real subjects and people watch porn in their relationships or alone. Um, so I feel like it was a cool topic and I hope you guys love the episode. She started her own podcast. It's called Chatting with Candice. So if you guys want to check that out, you can find her podcast. But other than that, I just want to like get into the episode so you guys can hear it. So here is Candice. Okay, let's welcome Candice Horback to Vulnerable. Candice, welcome to the studio. Thank you for having me. Of course, and welcome to New York. You're not from here, right? I spent a lot of time in upstate. So like oh. when people ask where I'm from, I never know how to answer that because it's like so many answers. So Southern California, upstate New York, and then I've been in South and North Carolina for like the last 13 years. Okay, cool. So all over. Yeah, and this is the first time, guys, that I've ever had anyone like on the pod in the studio where it's the first time we're meeting. So I'm going to be learning everything about Candice along with you guys. Um, let's start off with your age, your sign, and your current relationship status. So I'm 34. I had a birthday just like a few days ago. Oh, so happy birthday. Yeah, that's the first time <laughs> saying it out loud, which is weird. <laughs> um, I'm a Gemini and a snake, so it depends if you're doing like Eastern or Western astrology. Oh my God, I don't even know anything about the Oh snake. my gosh, you have to combine. <gasps> like, I feel like you don't get a full picture unless you're doing all of it. And then there's a the numerology if you're into that. Yeah. And Yes. Oh my God, I did not need to hear yes, this. You I'm already obsessed with it. You gotta check it out. You just dive in. It's so much fun. And then it, I think it brings a lot of personality to the person. And you're like, okay, that makes it a lot more individual than just like a Gemini. Yeah. Right? Um, so she, yeah, you should check it out. It's okay. really fun. Um, and then I'm married. Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for some listeners who might not know who you are, can you give us kind of like a brief little synopsis about yourself and kind of how you ended up at this point in your journey and career? So I was in the adult industry for about 10 years. I was a contract girl, um, like top 10 performer internationally. Um, I did that for a while and I always said I would stop doing it when it wasn't fun or if I felt like there was a disalignment happening. And then I got to that point, which we can get into if you want. Um, and I, it led me to start self-producing. And then in that, I was like, well, I want to be doing more. Like I really want to tap into like this creative energy and there's more than just this sexual outlet for me. And my husband kept but like nudging me to do podcasts and I just did not feel ready for me that felt a lot more vulnerable and a lot more um personal and invasive yeah. than doing adult film which is probably <laughs> really surprising to some people and then the pandemic happened and everyone had all this time on their hands so i'm like well let's turn this into like some like an opportunity and i started the podcast and here we are three years later amazing yeah. both of us in the podcast space mm -hmm. no i feel the same way as you obviously don't know what it's like to be in the entertainment adult entertainment industry but podcasts are so vulnerable mm -hmm. like speaking about your feelings and like literally being in somebody's headphones like that's very intimate <laughs> mm -hmm. um so 
when you were in the entertainment, adult entertainment industry, is that when, did you already meet your husband when you were in it or? So I, I had met him like as I was getting started. So okay. I, I like really tiptoed my way throughout the industry. So I started with just webcamming and it was all implied. So I didn't even show a nipple, like nothing. Okay. And it's funny because I saw a clip of you on um, one of the reality shows and he's like, oh, fix your top. Yeah. And you're like, I'm a model half of Manhattan. You see my nipple. My nip like, That's amazing. Yeah, I thought that was great. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I, I started showing nothing and then it I was really bored. I was like, this isn't the way I want to express myself. Camming was not for me. It felt very transactional. Mm. And I knew I wanted to do films. So I um I had just like reached out to this company that I really liked stuff that I'd seen or like the contract girls that they had. And I was like, I want to be like that. So I was like, do you how do you audition? And they're like, yeah. No, there is no audition. If someone tells you to audition, like run the other way. Oh that is God. a red flag. So I, I started him during the webcam process. So then when I started doing film, it was just solo. And then I eventually moved to Girl Girl, which most guys are fine with. So that wasn't an issue. And then as my name started getting bigger and I knew I had to make the decision to do like hardcore film if I wanted to like get to the top of the industry. And it was something I like genuinely wanted to experiment with and play with. And that was the conversation mm, for like really two <laughs> years between the two of us because it was back and forth. And what does this mean? And what does that look like? And then how do we redefine our relationship? <laughs> and will it work? Or is that going to be the end of us and I mean all of the questions you would typically ask and then having to face what jealousy meant to you and what unconditional love meant to you and what attachment meant to you um, and being like super honest with those conversations and then he got to a space essentially that was I don't ever want to be in a position of like holding you back from mm. what you want to do I can't guarantee that I'm going to be here after because like I don't know what this experience is, is going to be like for me, which I thought was amazing of him to say. Yeah. And we both decided like to let me follow it, you know, what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge testament to like how strong you guys are in your relationship too, because like he kind of said, like it's not a position he's been in before. So he can't control, not, not control, but like wouldn't know how he's going to react. Right. And then it's also like not your fault for wanting to do what you want to do. So it's kind of just like it's nobody's fault or like, and everyone should be able to have what they want. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really cool that you guys were able to figure it out and work it out. Um, I asked that question because I was curious about how dating was when you were mm -hmm. still working in the industry because I imagine it would be ridiculous <laughs> trying to like tell guys that you do that and like their reactions. I see a lot of people struggle for sure if they um, already start having like a really well established name and then like fans will come and you can't, that's like a barrier that's almost impossible to break. Like if someone's a fan, you're not gonna be able to kind of transmute that into a real relationship because there's a weird hierarchy that's happening there, yep. even if it's in their own mind. Um, so then that's like, you know, a whole bunch of people because everyone watches porn <laughs> to yeah. some extent. Um, um, so that takes off all of those men or women. And then, I don't know, finding someone that is okay is okay with that line of work is also very limiting. If you're constantly like, sacrificing your integrity or like these true pieces of yourself in order to appease a potential dating market, that doesn't make sense because the person that you find is, is not going to be in alignment with who you truly are because it's now like this very watered down version of yourself in hopes of meeting this love of your life. And then that doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said something about like everyone watches porn and I wanted to talk about like porn in relationships too because actually I'd love to start with like your relationship with porn before you were in the industry. Oh my God, I considered it cheating. You did? I did. Oh my God. I was wildly jealous. Like I was like, not that really any like severe amount of jealousy is a good thing, but um, like just totally out of control, like not really conscious of why I felt what I was feeling and like very righteous in my feelings, which mm. is like not a good, healthy place to be. Um, and I considered like if <clears throat> if someone were to like acknowledge beauty in someone else, that, that somehow took away from mine. Mm. And it was like this comparison model that I got stuck in. So I think that's where a lot of people are, but they've tried to do these studies of like the implications of watching porn. But in order to do that, you have to have a control. So you have to have a group of people that have never seen it and they can't do it. Oh, they can't find it. Can't anyone. do it. <laughs> right. Oh my God. That's crazy. So how did you go from thinking it was cheating to wanting to be at the top of the industry? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. A lot, a lot of like radical honesty within myself and like what I wanted. And for me, I wanted a place where I could explore my sexuality 
what did that mean as like a create <clears throat> a creative energy um I was in a place where I was like really ashamed of it. Like I was ashamed of pleasure. I was ashamed of expressing myself in that way. And I didn't want it anymore. Like I wanted to like, I don't know, find that aliveness that came with that energy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then also just like the confidence that came from these women that I was looking up to, like Jenna Jameson and Carmen Electra and Pamela Anderson. I was like, these are goddesses among women. And how do I tap into that? And then kind of reestablishing that like pleasure and sex are not wrong. Um, we've been conditioned to think that. And you can do things with integrity and out of integrity and what that looks like is just making a conscious decision so are you acting from a place of fullness like i'm already full and happy or am i acting at from a place of like deficit where i'm trying to like take something from the outside to fill my cup essentially so i think one can be beautiful and positive and the other one is like a hungry ghost where you're never going to feel satiated um so for me it was like it, it was just true alignment it was like me really wanting to find out like who i was and um like honor that that energy and honor like pleasure yeah that's beautiful i feel like a lot of people i feel like when i first started watching porn like when i was younger like i was so ashamed like mm -hmm. and i think there's so much guilt associated with that and with pleasure especially as a woman um and it's hard to break out of that because it's a very societal norm that's almost like ingrained in our culture that you don't even realize is happening mm -hmm. until you start questioning it. And then you're like, wait, I shouldn't have to be embarrassed about this. I shouldn't have to be like scared to have pleasure or enjoy myself in that way. Um, so yeah, I think it's so crazy that you, not crazy, but like it's-, no, it's, it's It is it's, crazy. It is, <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is crazy when you're letting your emotionals, like your, emo your emotions make decisions for your life. Like that yeah. is pretty crazy. And like this idea that women, aren't, women don't want pleasure, we don't want sex is actually just like a misinterpretation of this, um, like this research that happened on a campus like one time. So they went around and they asked like all of these college like young men, um, if you could go home with like this random girl, would you have sex? And almost all of the men like said yes, mm. of course. Um, they asked that to women and they said no. But it's like, well, first of all, why did they say no? And it's of course, right? You can't go home with a strange man because it's dangerous. Right. They changed it to the, w the question to the women which was if you were to go home with like this hot shot that everyone knew and he was like the guy, almost every woman said yes because now safety has been established. So it had nothing to do with like not wanting to experience sex, pleasure, being ravaged. It had to do with like just the fundamental basic um, biology of like, is this safe? I can't go home with someone who's bigger and stronger than me because right. it could go south very quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point because that was the literal first thing I thought of when you asked that question. Mm -hmm. I was like, you can't go home with a stranger guy. No, like you, you don't know. You're, you're scared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so now that you're married, do you feel like knowing everything that you know about the industry, you are still okay with like your partner watching porn or like recommending that people watch porn with their partners? So I think it goes back to like doing things consciously. Mm -hmm. So when you're consuming porn, I think that you can use it as a tool, right? So like in and of itself, it's not good or bad. <clears throat> it's like how you use it. So if you're consciously consuming it, you're not like binging eight hours a day and it's not like an, a, a tool a tool for avoidance or escape or procrastination. Um, if it's truly to like connect with your partner or maybe, and not even maybe, like there is a sexual difference in our appetites from men and women. So men tend to, ha um, <clears throat> to want a lot more sex than women do. So it's like, well, how do you how do you bridge that gap? Like, you don't want to have sex if you don't want to have sex. But then you also, why does he have to make the sacrifice alone? So like, why can't you come to like a conscious agreement between the two of you? I know some women like the guy's not even allowed to masturbate. I'm like, what is that? Like, you're acting like his mom. Like, that's weird. Like, you're now not allowing him to connect with his own body. So it has nothing to do with pornography. It's like the sense of control almost. Yeah. Um, and I think that that relationship is like doomed. And if not doomed, it's like it's going to be filled with lies because he can't trust to come to you with anything because you're going to react in this predictable way. So when you're approaching sex and you're in a couple in a relationship, it's like, well, can we use it together? And if she's uncomfortable with it, maybe let her pick first, right? Like help her navigate it, um, enter at a level that she's comfortable with and explore like her fantasy first so that she can feel comfortable and see that it's not a competition. And if anything, it's like this really cool spicy way to like keep that um, ember alive, especially if you've been together for like 10 years or right? you have to like introduce some kind of novelty. So if you don't want it to be another person, it could be a toy, it could be film, it could be whatever you want it to be, whether it's even role playing. But I can see it as like a great source of inspiration um, to like bring in creativity into the bedroom 
Yeah, that masturbating thing is crazy. <laughs> it's a thing. You'd be so surprised at how often I hear that from men. They're like, my partner will not let me. Like, if she found out I masturbated in the shower, it would be a fight. And it's like, why? Like, that kind of control over someone is is really scary to me. Well, it's also uh, like you're policing someone else's body at that point. Yeah. 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 Also, mm-hmm. I just don't see what's threatening about, like, they want to covet the pleasure like that it, because a lot like a lot of women, unfortunately, like more in like the more immature version of like their femininity, like they weaponize sexuality. Mm. So it's like if you don't take out the trash and if I'm not satisfied with you as a partner, I'm going to withhold sex. And yeah. sex is such a necessity for men. Like it is like a true way that they connect and have that union with their partner. So to weaponize that just doesn't feel like it's aligned or it's integral or um, like you're truly doing it for like the best of the relationship. Yeah, that is wild. <laughs> um, there was something you said that made me think about like performing Mm -hmm. and I feel like um I think a lot of women are threatened by porn because of the competition aspect that you mentioned Mm -hmm. but it's also like people say okay it's unrealistic to have my partner looking at this watching this and expecting me to perform like that in the bedroom Mm -hmm. so is there any part of you that now feels like and I don't know if you felt like you had to perform or if you were just having a good time when you were doing it like for work but now in your sex life do you feel like you will have to almost perform. So the performance thing is interesting. Um, I do not think that men should come to their partner and say, like, I expect you to do this. Like, I don't think that that's okay unless that's established within, like, you're, you know, you're playing around together and that's, you're both consenting. Right. I do want to touch on, like, it goes both ways too, though. Like, I I hate when I see women that um, – expect to be like made out with in the rain and <laughs> they s- bought the property when they first fell in love and they're like reenacting the notebook and Ryan Re- like or a Ryan Reynolds scene or Ryan Gosling whatever right. um so you shouldn't have like these f- like fantasies like pushed on or superimposed onto your partner either way right mm-hmm. like i think that's a problem performing again i think you can do it in a playful way where it's fun it's it shouldn't feel like it's an obligation. Like you shouldn't be so lost in the performance that you're not being able to experience like pleasure and ecstasy in that moment as well. So like don't sacrifice your own experience to like perform for someone else. Now, sometimes it's amazing to perform for your partner. It could be like a huge turn on. Like maybe you want to play that you're a dom and you dress up and like boss him around and he's not allowed to do anything. Like that could be super fun. Um, But that's very different than like, is my stomach sucked in? Is my makeup fine? Is this face fine? Like those are two very different ways of performing. Um, I got caught up in performing for a while because I was filming um, like, I don't know, like five scenes a month which actually isn't a lot, like com- comparatively speaking, but you're around um, other performers, you're on set, like you kind of associate sex with that performance. So it was really hard to establish intimacy in my real life. And I had to like consciously reintegrate that. So I don't, there is no camera. This <laughs> isn't going online. This is, those are two very different kinds of sex. Like I call it junk food sex and it's fine once in a while, but like you need to have sustenance and something real. And then that again can be scary, right? Like being vulnerable can be fucking terrifying (laughs) um and you have to be okay with that and allow that trust within that relationship so it's like let go just let go and then that's when you have the best sex of your life yeah right like you're truly combining becoming one person like your breathing gets in alignment because you're not focused on anything external right yeah and you said that when you decided to leave the industry was because it wasn't that much fun for you anymore so how long did you say again you were in it for like 10 years Mm -hmm. okay So before you decided to leave, I guess I'm just curious about like people always wonder if the people are actually having a good time or if like they're just doing it because it's a job. Like Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it is work. Mm -hmm. So like you until you decided to leave while you're I don't even know what to call it. Sorry. like While you're having sex. Yeah. Are you like were you enjoying it like genuinely? So I think it's like it's going to sound crazy. It's like any other job. Right. So some days you go in and you're like, I fucking love what I do. This is amazing. I was meant for it. And other days you're like, when do I get paid and when do I get to leave? Like, I just do not want to be on the set anymore. 
those were few and far between for okay. me. Um, I think everyone has their own experience within the industry, obviously. But for me, towards the end, it wasn't even that I wasn't having fun anymore because like you can get over that, right? Like that's just reframe and be like grateful for your situation, whatever it is you want to do. But um, I was in a particular situation where I was kind of like contract to contract to contract, which is really unusual. Um, and within that contract, like it was getting broken left, right, and center, and nothing was happening. And I was coming to sets where, so when you have scenes, they're priced out per act, and you, like these are negotiated beforehand. So like if oh. I do this, this is the pay. This okay. is these are my boundaries. These are t- types of scenes I will never shoot or that I'm not interested in shooting. Like don't even bring them to me. That kind of thing. Okay. Um, that was well established. I would show up to set. And they were, and this was in like the UK too. So like, they very much know what they're doing when these kinds of things happen, right? They isolate you. You don't have a support team, like support system. Um, so they, you're more likely to say yes. They spring it on to you because then you're again like women are more agreeable by nature. So like we don't want to rock the boat. So I'm just gonna go along to get along. Don't want to make anyone mad at the expense of my own self, my own peace. Um, so I would show up to set and they'd be like, oh, we're doing like a gangbang today. And I'm like, I've never done one of those. I don't want to do one of those we haven't established if i was comfortable what the price is like they were just hoping that i would do it for regular boy girl right so that would happen um i'd show up and it would be like an anal scene i'm like i haven't done that yet i haven't established like all of those other parameters like why then you know they're like, well if you don't shoot you're costing all this money i guess where i'm costing you all this money i'm not doing it yeah um i'm very disagreeable by nature and it's like <laughs> served me very well so like those things kind of kept happening and I would see my other contract stars like just going along to get along. I'm like, this is not okay. So I went to Twitter and I was like, this is what happened. They're not allowing me to even cho- like choose where the guy finishes. And again, like that's <laughs> my own body. Um, I was like, I'm sick of it always being in my face. Like that's, you know what I mean? Like I don't want that. I yeah. don't want that. And the moment that you told me I'm not allowed to pick that, I went to social media. And then I immediately got a call from the office and they were like, you're fired. So I got fired for it. Um, So it was them breaching the contract. I then got blacklisted from every single agency because it's basically one big monopoly. No one would touch me. And then I had to be like, I was terrified. It's like once you make the decision to do porn, you can't go have a regular job because society now says you're untouchable. That is what it is. I kind of kind of knew that going into it. Um, I now can't shoot within the, in the industry because I have rules and boundaries over my body. So it's like you know, what am I left to do? I'm going to start my own production company. So I did that and I was terrified and I was like, what if no one sees my name and I can't pay my bills? And now like, what do I do with the rest of my life? And thank God, I mean, it all worked out. I've never been more successful now that I left the industry. And now I have this like amazing platform to tell other women, like you do not need these big companies. If you're going to do it, do it on your own because you owning the content and your image is so important because they don't give a shit about you at the end of the day. Like you are disposable. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's just like the contract thing reminded me of like reality TV. Um, But it's different because it's literally like, obviously, they're using my name and image and face, but it's Mm -hmm. it's you're doing things with your body. So for them to be like, not allowing you to choose. That's so crazy to me. I know. <laughs> oh my and it's God. It's crazy to me that when you say that, like people within the industry will defend it. Be like she's a diva. And it's like, you're brainwashed. You're utterly brainwashed if you think it's okay that someone t- has any right over your body other than yourself. And also like just for preparation purposes, like how am I just going to show up to set one day and you'd be like, you're doing anal now. Like, right? what? <laughs> exactly. Um. And it was all these like moron men at, that were like in charge of kind of a like scheduling that and they're like oh well it's not a big deal like it's a very big deal <laughs> it's a, like you don't just do that yeah yeah no wow mm-hmm. um i was gonna ask about like i want to talk about women and i guess i feel like porn kind of is tied into like self-esteem for women and like i don't know too much about you or your platform but i feel like it seems like you would like to empower women and that that's something that I want to do too. So mm-hmm. I guess what I'm asking is kind of like how do you feel like porn plays a role in maybe self-esteem issues for young women? I think I mean so I think we look at porn immediately right because that's like the most obvious low-hanging fruit but if you look at like the Instagram studies that came out um, they were trying to make an Instagram for teens and preteens and then the study came out and it was like suicide rates for young girls 
like hockey stick up. Like it was exponential growth, um, bullying, exponential growth, um, suicidal ideation, depression, cutting, all of these things, body dysmorphia, eating disorders. So when you're kind of like getting pushed all of this stuff, it doesn't ma matter if it's porn or social media. I think all of this stuff is really harmful for young minds. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that's the responsibility of the parents and the caregivers. It's like, what protocols and protections do you have to like safeguard your young girls? Because like they, they need it, right? Their brains aren't done yet. They're getting like this dopamine um, fix and then saying do more and more and more of this and then two hours go by and they're lost in an algorithm. So that's your responsibility as a parent to make sure. Um, I think we had that growing up too. Like when you go checking out and you see Cosmo or you'd see Shape and it was always like a very specific type of body or Victoria's Secret. And I know there's a lot of controversy about like their rebranding. And like, yes, the previous angels were gorgeous. I don't think that anyone's denying that, but I do think it is beneficial to see real bodies there because as a little girl, when I only saw like Giselle's and Adriana Lima, that is a body type. That's not diet. That's not working out. That's yeah. not healthy um, for my body. I could never like even skip enough meals to look like Giselle. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So I think introducing like that reality is really important for, for women and young girls in general. Um, bringing it back to pornography, I think it's also parents get really squeamish around the sex topic, so we don't talk about it. And the the truth of the matter is, is it's designed for men. It's, it's a product for men, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's like when you make a, a romantic film or you make erotica, like that's designed for women. Like the erotica is like 80% women consume it. In porn, it's about 80% of men consume it. Mm. And we're not looking at erotica and saying there's something wrong with this because it's not made for men. It's like, no, men just don't have an interest in it. And no, women just don't have an interest in porn, broadly speaking. Um, so like if you look at the way that it's shot, we'll be like, oh, it's degrading to women. Well, if you look at gay film and how that's shot like man on man, it's shot just as invasively and it's just as graphic and explicit. It's just like that is what the male gaze finds erotic. Mm. Um, so if you look at other porn, like if it's um, shot by women for women, it's very different. And it's not because there's like a difference in um, necessarily values or principles. It's just like who is the target audience? Like this is capitalism at work. That's all it is. Like don't overthink it. So I think it's important to say this is an entertainment for men, for adult men. Um, this isn't meant to like be sexual education. This isn't supposed to depict reality. You're allowed to define define the boundaries within your own sexual container. Like you don't have to have like this giant um, billion dollar company tell you that. So just like uh, like defining her worth and her values and what does she want out of a partnership and obviously that conversation has to be like age appropriate so it depends on when you want to introduce it but establishing that this is entertainment for adults period yeah. is super important and you shouldn't be watching it until you are of age yeah it's kind of like um it's just anything any, too much of anything is like a problem mm -hmm. and I, it's, I mean i think in moderation like it's fine especially if you're like in the right headspace i think yeah um and then there's something else you said that I wanted to touch on. Oh, I was thinking about kids. Are you are you a parent? Yes, I have two. two okay. Boys. And how how have you and your husband like talked about this conversation as far as like them growing up and I mean maybe like other kids will ask like what did your mom used to do or like it's on the internet, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like cool. so it's a growing and evolving <laughs> conversation. Um I think it start, it starts with establishing that like the, there's nothing wrong with your body there's nothing wrong with being naked so i'm part japanese um in japanese culture like you see everyone naked all of the time like it's not sexualized mm. um like if you go to those bath houses like they're usually like co-ed and it's it's just not a thing um so like establishing just that first principle like there's nothing wrong with you like we don't believe in original sin in my house so like there's nothing wrong with you you were born divine and beautiful and pure um and then when it comes to like, what did mom do before I had you? It's like, I'm a whole person. I was a per whole person before you, during and after, and I will continue to be. And some things are meant for adults. Pornography is one of them. Um, I'm allowed to still be a sexual being just because I am a mother. And we have this idea of kind of fractionalizing women. And it's like, you, ha you can only wear one hat at a time. But there's this archetype and it's the maiden, the mother and the myth. Um, and it's the idea of it is to 
eventually in our life as women is to encompass all three. And it's not like you toss it away as you age. So the maiden is like this young, vibrant explorer and she's got this curiosity for the world and she's got this gentleness. And then you have this mother that is the protector um, and she's like a lot more solid in her in like her being and more like established and confident. And then you have this maiden who's got like wrinkles on her face and she's wise, but she, they all are magnifying. Like they're all, they all like gravitate everything, um, everything around them towards them. So it's like, you don't lose any of them. You just like take them on as you age and as like you gain life experience. So establishing that I am a whole person, right? And I think that that's where a lot of problems come in relationships is we try to like take that sexuality away from women once they become moms. And then it's like, Mm. who am I within my relationship then if I'm only allowed to be a mom? And then your husband or partner sees you as just a mom and they can't sexualize you either. And like again, that's such a huge role in how you connect with someone. So if you like sever that, you're like literally getting rid of the life force. So um I'll talk to you in like 10 years and let you know how it goes. But I think it just starts with values and empathy and compassion. And um, like, how do you how do we treat people? Right. Like in our house, like we don't we don't tolerate bullying. Right. Like we you stand up when you see something wrong. You say something. Use your voice. Like, don't be weak. Don't just go along to get along. Um, So like those are all, I guess, the starting points right now. Yeah. How old how old are your kids? Um, almost four and then 10 months. So like we got oh, okay. time, we got time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, you've got plenty of time. Um, okay, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and do vulnerable. <laughs> what advice would you give someone that's in a relationship that feels like their partner maybe compares them to porn, prioritizes porn, or kind of maybe idealizes it mm-hmm. and watches consumes too much of it like what advice would you give someone that's on the other side of it that doesn't really know how to tell them like hey this isn't working for our sex life Mm -hmm. so that's probably a good place to start is um addressing like the consumption issue and i think it's important not to get lost in it's a porn a porn problem because then you're not going to really get to the root of the issue so like what what are they really doing it's like avoiding the family avoiding you avoiding obligations um procrastinating just do they have compulsions with other things whether it's like eating gambling spending um usually those things will kind of work in alignment so yeah start with the porn and say you know obviously if you're watching way too much of this and you're not meeting my needs like sexually um we need to really taper back on that and like what is this about like what is what is it really that you're like hiding from like what are you trying to escape from because that's kind of what it is Mm. it's like i'm trying to escape from something um i don't know if maybe they're in like a depression or anxious or if like they themselves are feeling lost there was this interesting um dialogue that i saw and it was whenever you're feeling something within the relationship people are mirrors so if you are feeling isolated and unseen and unloved and like your um like your needs aren't being met your partner's probably feeling the exact same things Mm. so starting with um like in what ways like are you not feeling loved and like really bring compassion and empathy into it so that it they don't have to feel like they have to defend anything so i think a lot of times when we feel hurt um, or wronged it's like we want to go on the de- like the defense and like say how we're right or what we need but maybe approaching it with a little bit of like love and compassion and like seeing the other person will create a vulnerable space for them um, to like be honest and then maybe have like this breakthrough of oh my god I haven't been showing up for my wife or my partner I haven't been showing up for my family I've been really escaping from these things I had no idea so if you want to have like real um, like a real transformative experience and not just like this band-aid we slap onto it like you have to like go into it with what is the goal is it to heal and then to move forward or is it going to be i'm going to hang on to this righteous anger and every time we get mad and be like well remember when you did that because that's not going to serve either of you so if like you have to be honest with is it something you can forgive as well yeah and Mm -hmm. you almost probably have to take your ego out of it too because it's like you're coming from a place of hurt because i think a lot of people's feelings get hurt because they're like okay well he doesn't want to have sex with me and it has nothing to do with you so i think that's so important to establish has nothing to do with you or how desirable you are it's not that at all it's definitely a them issue um but you just want to create the space where they're they feel like they can be honest with you and not attacked yeah it's just like such a sensitive subject because i feel like it's so layered Mm -hmm. especially with all of our relationships with sex and how we like grew up looking at it and relationships with porn specifically Mm -hmm. but i kind of like what you said about um 
Like it's not about the porn. <laughs> it's never about the porn. Like there's always something else. It's mm -hmm. almost like cheating when people cheat. It's like it's never about that. There was an underlying issue that yeah, you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's out. not even about the person they cheated on you with. Right. It's not that at all. Right. It's like them trying to almost like create a different persona or maybe like reestablish a different version of themselves that they can't be with you or that they um they feel like died off a long time ago it's it's like an identity crisis it's not anything about you or the relationship or you're not good enough like so you have to like get that out of your head immediately yeah well you have been incredible candace <laughs> i you. literally have learned so much <laughs> in this hour i feel like i could ask you so many more questions um and you've been very vulnerable this whole time, but my final question for all my guests is, is there anything you want to be vulnerable about? Oh, <laughs> man. Yeah, that's hard given the nature of the conversation. I know, right? Um, it could, I mean, it doesn't have to be related to this topic at all. Yeah. Like anything that you're currently like going through, struggling with, working on that you think people would find relatable or anything oh, you want. So I guess my biggest and most like present vulnerability would be like I'm very into personal development. I think that we should never stop growing and learning and improving ourselves. So I do like a lot of um, whether they're summits or retreats or like I have the spiritual teacher I work with. And I think the thing I struggle with the most is constantly feeling like not accepted. Mm -hmm. And it goes beyond porn. Like this is since I was little. I, we moved around a ton. So I was always the new kid. I looked way more Japanese when I was little. So that was always like a way that I got picked on. Um, like the food I brought in was different. Like my grandma was different. Like, you know what I mean? So um, there was always something that made me an outsider. And then it's almost like I actively chose this profession to just like reestablish like my, my place on the outskirts. And it's like I have these ideas of what sex and sexuality should be should mean and what relationship should mean. Um, and I just feel like everywhere I go, I don't find a place where it's like an exact alignment. So if I go into like these more, um, I guess, like progressive spaces, I think it's like too far in some directions. And then if I go into other spaces, I was like, well, that's not far enough yeah. yet. So it's like, how do you... I don't know, I guess maybe just like doing podcasts and having conversations. It's like, how do you create a space where you're like very conscious about your sexuality and um, like who you are as a person? And I don't know, it's just that feeling of belonging, which I know is an inside job. It's like starts there, right? Like no one else can make you feel like you're belonging. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to like figure that out. Yeah, but that's hard. And I think it's super relatable for a lot of people. Um, and I also feel like, like I just turned, I just turned 30, I'm about to be 31. But <laughs> I feel like in your 30s, like that's when people say that's when you like kind of figure that mm -hmm. sort of piece out. Um, but <laughs> I was thinking about this TikTok that I saw and it was an Asian girl and she was like, you think you can hurt my feelings? I went to, do you see it? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, she was like, my Asian mom packed my lunch for school. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like you have people come over and you have like kimchi or like raw fish or like these rice balls and they're like, what is that? You are the gross smelly kid. So it's like, I already went through the ringer. It's fine, bring it's, it on, baby. <laughs> yeah, so funny. Sorry, you were being so vulnerable when I brought that. <laughs> no, I thought it was no, so funny. No, great. <laughs> um, well, I feel like it's, like you said, when you started your own um, production and your podcast and your platform, it's like you, even if you haven't been able to necessarily find a space where you feel like you fit in, it's like you have created and are actively working on creating one. I mm -hmm. think that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, please tell everyone where they can find you, your handles and everything else. Um, so you can go to chattingwithcandice.com. My podcast is there. My socials are all Candice Horback. Um, easy to find. Very rare last, very, very rare Polish last name that I took from my husband. Um, so yeah, that's where you can find me. Okay, cool. And you can watch this full episode at Vulnerable Pod on YouTube. We're on TikTok at Vulnerable Pod, and you can find me at Chelsea Vaughn on Insta. But that's it, guys. We'll see you next episode. Bye.